How would you like a 15% discount to my daily email, the stack of stuff, the show notes, discounts to the conference, all of that? All you need to do is text the word SHOW to 33777. You'll get the annual subscription with a 15% discount to my daily email. You'll get the stack of stuff, the links to the show notes, discounts to the conference, and so much more. All you have to do is text the word SHOW, S-H-O-W, to 33777. Text SHOW to 33777. Welcome to the Eric Erickson Show podcast, Hour 2. Greetings, conversationalists. Welcome. It's Eric Erickson here. I'm, I'm using my in-national public radio tone of voice because I feel like we were all yelled at by the president last night, so I should probably reduce the volume of my voice. Calm, soothing, melodious voice. <laughs> it's not going to happen. Sorry. The phone number this open line Friday, 877-973-7425, should you wish to be on the program. Uh, I want to, we got folks who are waiting and they want to chime in their views on the State of the Union. And before I move on to topics, let me, let's deal with those. uh, We've got to talk about this intelligence, uh, this sergeant who's been arrested for giving secrets to China, which we will. If you haven't heard about this, it got and got overshadowed in the news of the State of the Union, but there's a larger issue here. First, however... Uh, Ken, I want to go to you next. Welcome. Thanks for taking my call, Eric. Uh, sure. I just wanted to chime in on the Ukraine issue. And uh, Joe Biden keeps asking for more money, more money, more money. But yet he denies them the, the, the military aid and the, the equipment that they actually need to, to defend yes. themselves and to, to win the war. Okay? He, he, don't, he, don't, he didn't let Poland do the, give them the MiG fighters. He, he, he delayed the tanks going over there. Uh, yeah, not MiGs, the F-16s. Missiles. Yeah, and, and, and uh, yeah, that too. And we've got the, the long-range missiles that could be utilized. Mm-hmm. You go into a war to win a war. You don't go into a war to extend the war. So mm. if he wants to end the war, give them, the, give them what they need, and let's do it with it. Be done yeah, okay. It. So, Ken, you know, it's, it's funny you yeah. say this because I've talked now to a couple of Republican senators who uh, they would be described as neocons by some or, or hawks by others. And they all tell me they have slowly come to the realization that Biden really has no interest in helping Ukraine. He's just using it as a cudgel against Republicans for the very reasons you're citing. Folks, if y'all don't if y'all don't know this, Biden has promised Ukraine a series of missiles, tanks and aircraft, and he's not actually delivered any of them. And what the White House said was, well, it takes time to train them. The problem is they're not even training the Ukrainians on this stuff. There are real needs Ukrainians have, and we can structure this. In fact, I was talking to one member of Congress who said, here's a very easy way to help Ukraine. We need next generation weapons in this country. We have built back up our supply chains, but we haven't appropriated the funds to build our next generations of missiles, tanks, and aircraft. And what we can do is we can start building those and then give our surplus old equipment to the Ukrainians, which the Pentagon would be allowed to do without congressional authorization. But Joe Biden won't even allow us to start building our fifth and sixth generation weapon systems. He he refuses to have the money. Congress is willing to give the money. Joe Biden's military is too interested in educating us on DEI uh, instead of actually killing bad guys. It's a huge problem that, of course, the media is not covering it because the media is, is circling the wagons around Joe Biden. Y'all, it's a huge issue. Think about this. You have the votes in Congress to appropriate and build the next generation weapon systems in this country, and the Pentagon, without congressional approval, could send the surplus equipment to our European allies who could give it to Ukraine. And Biden won't do that. He wants to talk about the issue without doing anything. Now, I talked to a friend of mine in Congress when I was in Washington on the Wednesday, a good member of Congress who cares deeply about the border. And he said he would be willing to vote to fund Ukraine and Israel if Biden would secure funds to fund the border. But Biden won't even do that. He could have his way if he would just secure the border. But there aren't the votes to take care of Ukraine without the border. Now, if you're a longtime listener of this program, you know 
I actually am concerned with Ukraine. I do want to help Ukraine. I think it's better for us to allow the Ukrainians to kill the Russians than for us to have to kill the Russians, which we're eventually going to have to do if we don't help Ukraine. But even I want to secure the border first. It makes no sense to help any other country if we're not going to help ourselves. You know, a a buddy of mine tipped me off to this. In my area of Georgia, in middle Georgia, they're doing homeless censuses. They're, they're doing a homeless number counts. How many homeless do we have? Is it rising? Is it going down? Where are they from? And they're seeing increasing numbers of illegal aliens in rural parts of Georgia and in, in suburban and in small city Georgia that are illegal aliens, not American citizens. And those illegal aliens who are now part of the homeless population are consuming the resources that are meant to help the Americans, the veterans in particular, who have become homeless, the people struggling with mental health in this country who are Americans. This is a massive issue and one the Democrats refuse to talk about, one the Democrats don't want to deal with. You secure the border, you then eliminate a lot of the costs associated with having to to cover the social costs of illegal aliens, but they don't want to do that. They need their populations for the census. All right, back to the phones. Harold, you're up next. Welcome to the show. Harold, uh, Harold, that's right. Um, (laughs) Welcome. Eric, it's a pleasure to finally uh, talk to you in person for first time in a while. Uh, Just a a quick comment about the State of the Union, which is not why I called, but I didn't realize until I got up this morning, I forgot to remove my earplugs. So uh, (laughs) now that I have done that, now that I have done that, uh, the reason why I was calling uh, is I was listening to a conservative talk show, and they had a former Obama advisor I wish I could remember his name, but I can't. Uh, but he had something to do with the border, homeland security, whatever. And they were asking him uh, about – this is before Lakin's death as well, by mm-hmm. the way. And they asked him what would he do, you know, had I ideas. And I never heard anybody mention this before, and he mentioned that he thought we might ought to consider – helping Mexico secure their southern border to somewhat slow down the input of people that are walking. I know it wouldn't stop the people who are flying in. So that was the question. What is your opinion? Had you heard this before? What do you think? Thanks. Yeah, okay. Um, So here's my concern with that is uh, Chiapas is the southern region of Mexico that borders Guatemala. So Mexico has two countries that border to the south, Belize, which isn't a problem, and Guatemala, which is a massive problem. Uh, The problem with trying to cover that border is it's actually a harder border to cover than to cover our border. Um, because you not only have high mountain ranges and desert and jungle and plains, uh, you've also got coastal regions that are easier to navigate with us. Yeah, it's mountainous, but it's mostly desert and Rio Grande. We, we have some natural barriers that Mexico doesn't have with Guatemala. At the same time, that area is so plagued and overrun with in the Chiapas region in particular with the drug cartels, it would become very, very, very hard for us to engage without putting our soldiers' lives on the line in that area. Um, It it would risk uh, exacerbating a security situation with the drug cartels. At the same time as well, you have to understand that the AMLO, the president of Mexico, who's actually about to be gone, but is going to be replaced with his heir apparent, uh, hand-picked successor, is in the pocket of the drug cartel. So he doesn't even want us down there helping to try to secure the border because it cuts into the profits of the drug cartels who are also the coyotes getting these people across. Something the president said last night that was real and legit is that these guys make $8,000 per person. They're trying to uh, get across the border. It's a massive amount of money that the cartels make, not from drug sales, but from human trafficking. We would be interfering greatly with there. So there's no interest. What we need to do, honestly, and I don't know that we have the stomach for it, but we need a, a uh, Tom Clancy clear and present danger, uh, go blow up the Mexican drug cartels and go to war with them. We we are at war with them. Americans have a uh, wonderful, brilliant sense of never recognizing when others are at war with us. And we are at war with these drug cartels, and we should start acting like it, whether AMLO wants us to or not. Eight seven seven nine seven three seven four two five is the number. Michael, you're going to be up next. Welcome to the show. How are you? I'm good. How are you, Eric? 
I'm Good. a pleasure to be on the radio with you. I, I've been years trying to get the number to call you. Well, welcome. Okay, well, let me let me tell you this. I have a yard man that lives across the street from me, known him for about five, ten years. And he uh, he works in yards, of course, and he's been working around some guys that are from Venezuela that are illegal. And he told me that they personally told him that they – that the Biden administration is paying their lawyers to get them papers on the condition that they vote Democrat. Well, that's a fascinating one. That is a yeah. new one for me. Um, I and will he, tell you he, this. It wouldn't surprise me if something like that was, and I, I, you know, people, people say all sorts of things. I don't know that that's actually happening. It wouldn't surprise me though. Would it surprise any of you? Here's a problem though. And this is the long-term reason that I'm not really freaked out. Look, I, we need to secure the border. We need to take all the illegal aliens who've come and send them back home. But if you're a Republican freaking out that they're going to ultimately upend the country, keep in mind that second and third generation Hispanic voters in this country have trended Republican. And a lot of the people who are the, the – if you're not from Mex- – if you're Mexican, an illegal alien – you tend to be a Democrat. But if you're from south of Mexico and Central and South America, long term, your family tends to trend right. The reason being because you tend to be a religious Catholic who has uh, fled socialism and you don't like socialists. And so you tend to become voting. There. This is why Democrats are playing with fire on this and Democratic strategists kind of understand it. What I also think is a greater point here is when you look at the acceptance of illegal immigration in this country, there's been a massive trend on the left to accept illegal immigration. The right has not actually changed, and actually centrist Democrats haven't changed their views. It's the left. And so for all of the people in the media lecturing Republicans on radicalization on this issue, it's not really the Republicans at all who are radicalizing. It's the progressive left and members of the media who are. Rick, you're going to be the last caller before break. Welcome to the show. How are you? Rick, you there? Yes, sir. Welcome. How are you? Um, yeah, I'm wondering why there's never a uh, response. I don't know if you saw the response, the Republican response. I Sadly, to I had to watch it all for you guys. Yes. It was very, it was cringy. Yes. So have, uh, you know, like an audience, almost like a, uh, a rally or something, where at least the person can uh had some applause lines and yeah okay you know they they've done that a couple of times and i've always thought they weren't better uh during the clinton administration christy todd whitman uh the republicans took over the state legislature in new jersey and she did it before the new jersey republicans the state legislature and it was good and then somebody did one in a cafe a while back i forget who it was maybe it was tim scott or somebody and and that one worked well but yeah these standalone speeches are never good I continue to insist it was a strategic mistake of the GOP not to have Donald Trump give the response last night. They should have led the president give that response. It would have been, one, it would have been way more entertaining than Joe Biden's speech. And two, the media would have freaked out. And forcing the media's hand on this and exposing what hacks they are for the Democrats, many of them would have said, well, we can't, we can't continue because... We can't fact check this liar. Uh, It would have shown their biases. It would have tipped their hand. It would have discredited them. And I actually think that's a good thing. I think the American public needs to be reminded that the media has an emotionally vested interest in helping Joe Biden. And every opportunity Republicans get to show that bias, they should be given that. They should have fundamentally had Donald Trump give the State of the Union response last night. He is the Republican nominee. He is a former president. He was called out repeatedly by Joe Biden last night as my predecessor. It would have worked. I don't know the thinking. Maybe they offered it and he declined. I don't know, but they should have given it to Trump. He's the only person who should have been given the right to respond to Joe Biden last night, particularly because Joe Biden made Donald Trump and his policies a central focus of his response. And the thing about Trump is that he could have done it without a pre-written speech. He could have watched Joe Biden's speech and then freeform responded to it, and it would have been better than what Joe Biden gave. Hello and welcome. It is Eric Erickson here across the nation. This day after the most meaningless speech of the year, the State of the Union, everybody moves on by the end of the week. We're already on Friday. By Monday, it'll be forgotten. And yet you got to cover it because it is big news. However, this will be the big news. Y'all, I I predicted to you in the first hour this was going to happen. I am a prophet. I am not welcome in my own town. 
I told you this was going to happen. I predicted this was going to happen in the first hour of this program today. I just didn't think it would happen as quickly as it did. Democrats are already fuming over Joe Biden calling Lakin Riley's murderer an illegal. This is from Inside Politics with Dana Bash and California uh, Democratic Senator uh, and Emily's List activist, uh, LaFonza Butler. First of all, just the moment, but also on... on Oh, come on, audio. Everybody's watching the same clip. Shocked that this happened. Oh, on, on. Oh, come on. Sorry, guys. This term is the internet. Used illegal. There's some, been some backlash among some in his own party for using that term. Look, it was clear being in the chamber last night that there were those uh, on the extreme Republican Party who were trying to bait the president uh, into uh, responding to whatever heckle they were offering, offering. It's unfortunate that the president used that language. I don't believe that is the language that, believes, that he believes in his heart about uh, immigrant people who find their way uh, to this country to make a better life for themselves. <laughs> I don't believe it is hard. He believe, they are an illegal alien. That's actually the term in the federal code that she hasn't changed. LaFonza um, Butler, by the way, uh, she is the senator who replaced Diane Feinstein. She was the president of Emily's List. She's actually from Maryland, but Gavin Newsom appointed her to be the senator from California. She's a native of California. Um, yeah, and, and she's going to uh, say that it's unfortunate he would use the phrase illegal. That's what they are. That's what they are. The, you know, the Democrats and the media together are trying to say that this is racism, which is why I think you have to double down on saying illegal alien uh, every time you get. Uh, and when I go on TV and talk about these issues, I say illegal alien because I'm not going to let the Democrats shame me from using the truthful phrase uh, that they are illegal aliens and an illegal alien murderer, no less. And Joe Biden said an illegal you know, behind the scenes, the Democrats use that phrase to themselves. They just like the posture when they're in public to claim everybody else is a racist when really their policies perpetuate racism, the Democrats. Now, one of the groups out there exposing all this and the hypocrisy of it is Americans for Prosperity. You know, they went out and bought Bidenomics, the, the website, Bidenomics.com. You would think the Democrats would do it. It's just more political malpractice from the Democrats that they didn't buy this website and Americans for Prosperity snapped it up. You can go check it out, Bidenomics.com. It's got the truth of Joe Biden's agenda, the truth of his record. Notice he didn't use the phrase Bidenomics in his uh, speech last night. He, he tried to use the phrase stagflation instead, moving away from Bidenomics. It doesn't matter. He's wrapped himself in it, and Americans for Prosperity intends to make him own it with the website, Bidenomics.com. In fact, I haven't actually been there since the Bidenomics.com. You go there. Oh, and it changes from Bidenomics to Badnomics. <laughs> Bidenomics is bad economics. It's got the rhetoric versus the reality, what he's saying, what the reality is. This is a great website to get the actual facts about the economy. Thanks to Americans for Prosperity, Bidenomics.com. Go check it out today. Share it with your friends and family. Hello there. Welcome. It is Eric Erickson here. The full number, 877-973-7425, should you wish to be on the program. I would be very happy to have you, but for those of you on the phones, I realize it's an open line Friday, but I got to talk to you about something significant. We have a problem in our military intelligence community, and I'm not exactly sure what all is going on. You remember the uh, guy who set himself on fire, Aaron Bushnell, he was with the Air Force, and he uh, had been in uh, the 70th Intelligence Surveillance and Reconnaissance Wing, was a cyber defense operations specialist with the 531st Intelligence Support Squadron at Joint Base San Antonio, Lachlan, Texas. Been in military intelligence. And Aaron Bushnell was a rabid progressive uh, communist, an actual communist. I'm not meaning it pejoratively. He actually was who set himself on fire and killed himself in front of the Israeli embassy in Washington to protest them defending themselves and taking the fight to Hamas. And then a woman uh, from the intelligence community, Air Force, 
I forget her name, but she held a rally uh, there where he died in support of him, also from military intelligence. And now CBS News is reporting this. An active duty Army soldier and intelligence analyst spent over a year selling sensitive military documents related to the U.S. defense of Taiwan, weapon systems, and missile defense systems to China, federal prosecutors allege in an indictment unsealed Thursday. Sergeant Corbin Schultz is accused of using his top secret security clearance to download classified U.S. government records at the behest of an unnamed individual who claimed to live in Hong Kong, amassing $42,000 in the process. He was arrested Thursday and charged with six counts, including conspiracy and bribery. According to court filings, Schultz was a sergeant and intelligence analyst and assigned to the 506th Infantry Battalion. He's 24 years old from Willis Point, Texas. He also uh, passed on information related to Russia's war in Ukraine and the operability of sensitive U.S. military systems and their capability. Guys, I, I'm I'm concerned uh, with our military intelligence, and and I realize that there's the the euphemism, the joking about um, about military intelligence, but this isn't a joke. This is actually serious. A number of our soldiers, sailors, and airmen who work in military intelligence have been turning against the United States. One set himself on fire in front of the Israeli embassy. Another defended that guy. Another has now been arrested for selling classified information to the Chinese about the Russia-Ukraine war and about our situation, our handling of Taiwan and its defenses. Wasn't it a military intelligence officer as well who leaked information about Donald Trump who got arrested? This is becoming a pattern. Now, I realize that military intelligence tends to be uh, rooted out more and, and surveilled more by the FBI to make sure there are no leaks. So maybe disproportionately they get the, the spotlight, but that's not reassuring because that would then just suggest it's happening elsewhere and they're not getting caught. But this is really alarming. The number of progressive anti-American soldiers, sailors, and airmen inside military intelligence should be a red flag to our government. Now, when it happens once, okay, when it happens twice, well, that's a problem. When it happens repeatedly, this becomes a pattern. And between one who self-immolates and one who sells secrets and another who leaks stuff on Donald Trump, over the last several years, military intelligence across the services, it suggests it's been infiltrated by a bunch of America-hating woke activists. By August of 2023, Schultz, whose job was in part to instruct others on the proper handling of classified information, discussed with his Chinese handler the separate arrests that month of two U.S. Navy sailors accused of transmitting sensitive information to China. Schultz's co-conspirators advised him to be careful. And in November of 2023, Prosecutors alleged the handler asked Schultz to discuss work for the next year. The charges come days after Massachusetts Air National Guardsman Jack Tierra pled guilty to illegally posting classified military records on an online gaming platform in one of the military's most damaging leak campaigns. On Tuesday, an Air Force employee was charged with leaking classified information related to Russia's war in Ukraine to an individual over a foreign dating site. Y'all, this is not good. You should all be deeply alarmed by this. And I need you to understand something. This isn't about Joe Biden and this isn't about the Democrats. This isn't about Donald Trump and it's not about the Republicans. This is about a number of people in our military who are selling out our country 
who are sworn to protect and defend our republic who are undermining our republic. I don't think it's a coincidence that many of them happen to be progressive activists. I I don't think that's a coincidence at all, but they're not all progressive activists. I don't know what's going on in our intelligence services in the military. China and Russia, Iran, they're ruthless. We know Iranian agents have infiltrated the Biden administration. It is remarkable to me that Semaphor does a massive story with the names of the individuals who have infiltrated the Biden administration, who have sympathies to Iran, many of whom are still there, and the Biden administration has kind of waved the story away, and the mainstream media outside of Semaphore has largely ignored this explosive story, that Iranian agents have been embedded within this administration and the Obama administration, and sympathizers on the outside have been advising and directing things, and the guy who is leading our negotiations with Iran on this bad Iran deal has been pulled aside because of security and intelligence issues. And the national media has largely not talked about it because it puts Joe Biden in a bad light. This story is not about Joe Biden. The story is not about the Democrats, but it's woven into the story, the partisan fixations. But these guys in the military who are getting arrested would be there regardless of who the commander in chief is. And they all continue to undermine the United States and are working on behalf of China. I am not sure what can be done, but this now gets to the direct tie to this administration. What I know is not going to happen is a solution when the Secretary of Defense himself has been regularly disappearing from his job without telling anyone and has not been held accountable. At the end of the day, there's a problem within the military in the buck. If it doesn't stop at the commander-in-chief, certainly stops at the Secretary of Defense, who himself has not been fired for his dereliction of duty. Ironically, the Chinese, the Russians, and the Iranians probably knew more about Secretary Gates's condition than the President of the United States, because though Lloyd Austin refused to tell the President of the United States It was obvious he was gone and where he was, and I suspect the intelligence assets of our enemies knew better where he was than the President of the United States and his Chief of Staff did, let alone the Joint Chiefs of Staff and the Deputy Secretary of Defense. And we have these spies. Americans are selling out to the United States and its allies to China, Russia, and Iran from within. And disproportionately, they're coming from the intelligence community within the military, and that is deeply troubling, and something needs to happen, and there frankly should be a bipartisan congressional investigation into it. Now, 877-973-7425, that's the phone number. Back to the phones here. I want to take Jack's phone call. Jack, welcome to the show. How are you? Hey, Eric, how are you? I called you uh, some months ago about this, but you know we're, we've got 23 Democratic seats up for Re-election, 10 Republicans, and no Republican is vulnerable. So consider the fact we're going to be electing a lame duck president in November. The guy will come in with only four years. we got to go after these Senate seats hard. We do. We, we absolutely do. You know, at, at my gathering in August, um, we are, we're going to have uh, some of those great candidates there. We're going to have um, Dave McCormick from Pennsylvania, Tim Shee from Montana and others who are going to be present who are running for some of these Senate seats. Uh, and it, we've got to pick up the Senate. We, we've got to. Listen, whether we have the House or, the, or not doesn't matter as much as the Senate because the Senate Republicans, if they control the Senate, can block the bad nominations. It, let's say, worst case scenario, uh, Biden wins re-election, but we hold the Senate where well, we can block his judicial nominees and uh, hold accountable those cabinet positions who who – um, ask them tough questions, but also not just ask them tough questions, but when they resign, uh, vet the picks. Uh, people don't underestimate the power of the Senate. We have got to fight and hold the United States Senate. We make gains in the Senate. Listen, if the election were held today, it's not, but if it were held today, we would win the Senate or at least be tied in the Senate. Kamala Harris would give the Democrats a majority because Joe Manchin's out in West Virginia. We're going to win the West Virginia Senate seat. That makes the Senate 50-50. 
All we have to do is pick up either Montana or Nevada or Arizona or Pennsylvania or Ohio, and we win the Senate. In Ohio, if we get a good candidate there, we have a great chance in Ohio if we get a good candidate. We have a really great chance in Montana if we pick the right candidate. It looks like we're going to pick the right candidate there. We have a really good opportunity in Nevada to pick up Nevada this time. Pennsylvania with Dave McCormick is going to be tougher because of the dynamics of that state, but it's possible for McCormick. We got a great opportunity there. I worry about Kerry Lake in Arizona. I think the Arizona Republicans have lost their mind there. I don't think she's a great candidate. With Kristen Sinema out now, that race is going to consolidate Democrat-Republican, and Kerry Lake is a very weak nominee uh, for Arizona. She can still win, but it's going to be a much tougher fight. And if it was a better candidate, we would have to spend less resources there to get her across the line. That's not to say that people like uh, Ted Cruz and Rick Scott aren't going to have tough problems, but it's Texans and Florida. They're not going to have nearly the problems that a Kerry Lake's going to have in Arizona picking up that seat or a Dave McCormick in P- Pennsylvania. But Dave's got deep pockets himself, so he can help self-fund his race. We have real opportunities Real opportunities. And, and you know, we, we've got candidates in Michigan and Wisconsin as well. Uh, we've got real opportunities to pick up the Senate. We only need two seats to pick it up. We're going to get one in West Virginia. We just need one more. We've got to do that. We've got to pick sane, good candidates who can win. Y'all, let me tell you about my bank, Old Glory Bank. With this debanking trend of silencing people on the right, not just silencing people on the right, but also Um, turning off bank accounts or denying people the ability to make purchases through the bank accounts. That's the growing trend that the left and uh, these woke banks are doing. National banks and credit unions are blocking you from making transactions out of your bank account that they disagree with. In fact, there are a number of credit unions in the country and uh, several banks that are prohibiting you from buying firearms or even ammunition out of your bank account. you got to put it on a credit card. And then, of course, they're getting the credit cards to try to stop it as well. You're never going to have that problem with Old Glory Bank. They have a banking bill of rights. They want you to read it, how they don't just give your information to the government, how they don't uh, block you from making transactions, how they won't cancel your account because of who you are or what you believe. Old Glory Bank, they are my bank. I have been a customer of theirs for a year. They're a new advertiser on the show, and I'm glad they are. You can get an account with them in less than eight minutes, oldglorybank.com. I don't just have one. I've got my kids set up there as well. Why? Because they're an online bank with easy access around the country to be able to deposit cash into your bank account at actual retailers around the country, and they don't charge fees. So if you want a custodial account for your kids or you want an account for yourself, you're not going to get eaten alive with bank fees. There are none for the checking and savings account, and they're a regular bank. They do mortgages. They do loans. They do everything. For oldglorybank.com, go check them out. They should be your first choice for opening a bank account these days, oldglorybank.com. Get it for you. Get it for your kids. OldGloryBank.com. Member FDIC, equal housing lender terms and conditions apply. The lawyers make me say that. What I want to say is they really are my bank, and I love them, and you will too. Hello and welcome. It is Eric Erickson here. The phone number, 877-973-7425. Should you wish to be on the program, I got time to take a quick call here. Let me go to Clyde, who's been waiting patiently. Clyde, welcome to the show. How are you? Uh, thank you. I'm doing very well. And you? Doing great. I hope. I, I just want to first say that ever since I started l- listening to you, I've actually learned a lot more. You're you're not so much rhetoric as much as facts, and I, and oh, I appreciate that. it. Thank you. So my qu- my question is is in what reality do we actually think that Ukraine is going to stop Russia? Russia's being backed up by China now. Russia's selling oil. Mm-hmm. They're not going to run out of money. The little bit of money or a little bit of items that we give them isn't enough to win and we're just pouring our money into this and to me it's just a hole in the water that we're going to keep sinking money in and money in and money in and it's never going to end yeah I mean, oh you know what, so what is the I, what what go ahead well i support helping ukraine but i think they got to give up crimea and if this president is not pressuring uh Zelensky to give up crimea uh, and the eastern portions of Ukraine that Russia has dug in, then um, I, I think we can defensively help Ukraine. And, and frankly, and, and crassly, to some degree, it's a jobs program because the most of the money we send there is actually being sent to American weapons manufacturers around this country. It's not actually being sent to Ukraine. And the Ukrainians pay us back nonetheless. It's actually a, a financial boon for us. Uh, being done right. I don't think we need to be paying for their teachers. I don't think we need to be paying salaries, but weapons and stuff. The problem is we've got to get Ukraine to give up 
Crimea because it shouldn't have been theirs to begin with. It was a fluke of the 1990s that they wound up with it because Catherine the Great's the one who conquered it from the Turks back in uh, a long time ago in the 1700s. I think it was 1700s. It might have been earlier than that, but I think it was 1700s. Um, they've And the eastern portions of Ukraine that Russia was very easily able to take, they all speak Russian to begin with. They don't speak Ukrainian. There was always this divide. Defensively, though, we should be propping them up so that Russia can't advance further because uh, the president is right, and our intelligence does confirm it, and Vladimir Putin's own statements confirm it. They do want to move across southern Ukraine into Moldova, which would expand uh, this theater. We we can make it painful for them to do and keep them from doing it, but this president is only doing half measures. That's the problem. Is he saying, I'm going to give you all this stuff, Ukraine, and then he never actually sends it. He doesn't even send the training. Um, that's a huge problem. I do think we need to stand up for Ukraine. Uh, and let Ukrainians kill the Russians so our kids aren't killing the Russians. Uh, But this president just botches everything he touches.